So when you joined Epic Core, you said you've been a seen there four and a half years, you've mentioned, you know, one of your primary focuses was building that culture that permeated across the workforce. You know, for an organization that, that grows as Epicor has through, through mergers and acquisitions, for example, that can obviously be a challenge. You know, can you share some examples of, of how you've built the culture in, in what is a fast move, fast growing environment? And maybe there might be, a, you've touched a little bit on, on how you've adapted that culture over the last year as well. Absolutely. So. Um... Uh, you know, this, I think, is a really uh, timely and relevant topic, David, because uh, much like DE&I, uh, corporate culture is becoming the conversation for lots of board meetings. Uh, so when I came into Epicor, what I realized was that we really didn't have an Epicor culture, mostly because we had grown inorganically. So we had gotten to almost a billion dollars. And when I came, it was about 3,500 employees fairly inorganically. And you could see it, you know, easy examples are employee signatures would say the person's name and then it would say Activant, a subsidiary of Epicor. Well, that wasn't true. We had fully acquired Activant, right? Or they wouldn't even put Epicor anywhere in their signature and keep, you know, the signature they had from the acquisition they came in from. So uh, I knew that we needed to do that. The other thing that was going on at Epicor is that we actually were really looking at global workforce strategy differently. And we had just done a lift and shift for our Bangalore office. And back when we started, it was 14 employees, but quickly grew to 100 by the time I got here, in November of 2016. And then now we're at over 525 employees in Bangalore. But what I could tell was that um, there wasn't a cohesive sentiment across our employee base that we were all one team. And as I like to say, we were all one Epicor. So I would hear when I did my listening tour in town halls, you know, back when we were all traveling all the time, I would hear employees say, well, I feel like that all the jobs are going to those people over there in India or Mexico, or I can't believe you opened, you know, a support center in Budapest and you gave those people jobs that could have been ours. So there was a very much an us versus them mindset. And then last but not least, I actually took the time because one of my very first flights for Epicor was to India. And that is a very long flight from Austin, Texas. And there were seven, it was 27 hours, right? And of course, last minute, so I was in a middle seat. So I took the time to read our employee engagement feedback. And I had asked, the, my predecessor had already left and my seat had been empty for three months before I got there. So I had asked, I said, what do you do with this feedback that employees give you? You know, who reads it? Who actions it? And the answers from my peers were, well, you know, I mean, we kind of look at it sometimes, but it's usually the same. Well, I decided to read all 787 comments and it wasn't the same, but there were two or three big themes coming out. One was, I don't feel like I can meet my career potential at Epicor. I don't feel like this business is set up for success and longevity. And the third one, which was really shocking, was I don't trust the leadership team. I don't feel like this leadership team is interested in my um, growth and you know my success as much as they are in theirs. Pretty significant themes, right? And very bold. Uh, and so me being me, also being a little bit bold, I distilled all of that. And in December, I was at my first meeting with uh, my peers and our CEO, our then CEO. And I said, here's what's coming out. Here's what I think we need to do. But first and foremost, we need to create a one Epicor culture. Because until we get that and people feel like they're part of one company and their success is interdependent on each other, then we're not going to move them. The second thing we need to do is to create trust and in language that supports everybody's growth. So when we have any employees that say anything negative, like those people over there, or why'd you get rid of my friend and give this person in Budapest my job? We as leaders need to immediately course correct that. And we need to become more authentic and accessible to the employees because there's clearly an ivory tower mindset. So we picked our three big ones and we started working on it. And it was hard to get a lot of our employees to adapt because they've been here for a long time. But David, the way we did it was through small and significant change. So let me just walk you through two quick examples. One was really launching that top track, that narrative through our extended leadership team, all our VPs and above. So I started there and I said, you all need to start talking about it in every meeting, in every all hands you have, in every town hall you host. And if you're not comfortable, invite me and I'll do it. I mean, we, you know, at that point we're 3,500 people. I'm like, this is not that big of a deal. 
The second thing we did was really started putting our set, our employees at the center of our business value proposition. And this has really been very important to me. And I think the most fulfilling thing is the last three years, that's been part one of our corporate objectives, which is Epicor respects and values its employees and strives to be a great place to work. Not that we are, but strives to be. Because that's authentic. We're getting there, right? But I started putting our employees at the center of our value proposition. Here's the one example I'll give you. The year I started, there were just a lot of natural disasters. You know, you, you hate that it's happening, but between, you know, floods in California and fires um, in certain places, earthquakes, and then, you know, just droughts and floods in Texas. I said, you know what? We're not so big that we can't call and check in on every employee. So anytime there's a big natural disaster, we're going to make a list of all the employees that could potentially be impacted. And we're going to split up this list. And we're going to call everyone. And usually it was like 20 to 25 people per HR business partner, me included. And we started calling and it was at our first customer meeting. This, so remember, I started in November. April was when we had our big customer meeting. And we had this really nice happy hour for some of our tenured employees, you know, people that were celebrating 15, 20, 25 years. And um, after our CEO did a great toast and our now president, then CTO did a great toast, the, he said, does anybody else want to add anything? And one of our employees stood up, big, huge, six foot three male, you know, and he said, I want you all to know I've been at this company for 28 years and never once in my career has someone called to check on me and my family. And I'm going to choke up when I tell you this, but he started tearing up, you know, and he's probably in his late 50s, early 60s. And he said, I want you to know how much that meant to me. And for that reason alone, I'll retire out of this. Company. Right? I, I love that. Idea. Because that's a true example. And I have goosebumps talking to you about it because that's who I want to be. That's who I want Epicor to be because it makes me proud to work at Epicor. And, and now that's become part of our DNA. You know, we do it every time. And the employees now in a great way, expect it and still love it. And now our employees proactively, I even get emails saying, Jig, I want you to know that I'm, I'm good. We're safe. Don't worry about us in the store. In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital HR agenda. Make sure that you subscribe by your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.